So we start off the morning talking about neuropathic pain uh, symptoms, which are quite common. Uh, but I'd have to say right up there with neuropathic pain um, uh, is the issue of spasticity. And we're delighted to have one of our friends and colleagues, Dr. Daniel Becker, join us from the International Neurorehabilitation Institute and give us a talk on management of spasticity. So Dr. Becker, take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me out here. Um, I think last time was we did Ohio, right, Ben? Was it in uh, Columbus? All right, that was a couple of years ago, and I remember the, the room was packed, so I assume there's a lot of people who are online this, uh, this time. Uh, so thank you for, for having me, me speak on, on spasticity. The, uh, uh, one of the main questions we always get, and I know uh, the, the team has already done a, a fantastic job about talking about NMO and Margaret and, and, and all the conditions, but spasticity seems to be one of the most pressing uh, concerns that most people have um, uh, in our day-to-day -day clinical practices. So since it gets in, in the way with all kinds of functions. If you uh, were to uh, give it, uh, if you look in a dictionary and say what spasticity is, you know, it would be said it's, it's a motor disorder characterized by velocity-dependent increase in tonic stretch reflexes with exaggerated uh, uh, tendon jerks resulting from hyper-excitability of the stretch reflex. So if I were to send, mention this anywhere in the clinic, no, my, the, my patient's eyes would glass over and they would stop listening to me. So we always have to kind of make this a little bit more, uh, uh, more palatable. And so uh, what we usually talk about when we talk about spasticity is anything that relates to like a stiff muscle. So some people say, you know, they have, uh, when, they, when they get up after sitting for a long time on a plane or even just getting up in the morning, they kind of feel a bit stiffer, uh, all the way to difficulty with their posture, you know, uh, standing upright in the right way or with, with balance issues. Uh, and it could affect any limb, so it could be your arms, your legs, uh, but not only the limbs, but also the trunk. Um, and it, in, in very severe cases, can get in the way of your day-to-day -day activities, including uh, severe pain. So... Uh, one of the big questions people always have, you know, what can we do uh, about this? Uh, I'm sure um, many of you remember the, uh, uh, your biology slides, you know, what, what is our central nervous system? This is essentially the, the place where spasticity takes place. I'm going to come back to that picture in, in a second. And you see on top, top left, you see the brain, and then you see as you go down the, the spinal cord. Generally, spasticity is... Uh, caused by, by dysfunction within, within the spinal cord. And uh, if, you, if you read the, the, the causes of this, you know, we, we usually say spasticity is an injury to the cortical spinal tracts. And again, uh, most people don't really know what that, uh, what that essentially means. So if we, go, if we go back, this is the way back, then I, I give you the, the, the talk that I usually give to my patients. So um, we just talked about on break that I just became an empty nester at my house. I uh, had to uh, drop off my son at, at college. Uh, feels very lonely now, <laughs> and a lot older. Um, but so I, we, we compare the, the nerve cells or neurons in our uh, spinal cord essentially as uh, college kids. So they like to party, right? At least most of them. Um, and the brain is kind of the, the calming, humming voice of our parents. So it's, you, you can say it's the mom or the dad, it's both of them together, it's what the brain does. It essentially talks down the whole time to, down the spinal cord to these little party neurons. It's like, okay, calm, keep it down, keep it down, keep it down. Because the natural state of these neurons is they want to party. So what happens if you have an injury to the central nervous system, you know, mostly in, in, in the spinal, usually in the spinal cord, that you interrupt that calming voice from the brain that keeps these party neurons down. So now they can't hear it anymore. And then they look up and say, you know what? We don't hear anything anymore. Let's go crazy. Uh, and that's essentially what they do when, 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 uh, when spasticity happens. So it's be these, these overexcitable neurons in, uh, uh, in our spinal cord. And uh, typical symptoms, as I said, you know, it's, it's increased muscle tone. We got increased reflexes. So usually when we uh, uh, you know, tap on your, uh, on your knees and get a knee jerk and then you just starts flying out, you know, some people warn me, you know, oh, if you tap me here, just get out of the way. Um, I always say it's one of the rookie medical student mistakes. You know, if you kneel in front of your patient and tap on their knees if they have a spinal cord disorder, because you only do it once, uh, and then you will have learned that for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, so you can have, or some people could have clonus, you know, where people sort of just keep, you know, as you tap, and the, and the knee will not stop, will not stop moving. So all kinds of signs of um, 
uh, of, of spasticity. And uh, in that, it in turn then leads to decreased uh, with, with function. Um, you can have difficulty with walking, difficulty with dexterity. Um, it's, a, it's a big cause of fatigue because as you have to overcome the stiffness in some muscle, uh, you have to work a whole lot harder with the, with the intact muscles. And then in the more severe cases, it can really go uh, form into real contractures, you know, where the limb essentially stays in whatever position it is in. It can open up anymore. Uh, that then could actually cause difficulty with uh, not only mobility, but also with uh, personal care and hygiene. So uh, all kinds of things where we have to intervene later on. There are a couple of typical pictures here. You see sort of the hand contractures. You see the inversion in the foot. Uh, while we're talking about the foot, uh, I know many of my uh, TM patients uh, complain sometimes that they have their toe curling, where they sort of get uh, curl up and they can't do anything about it. And sometimes you see it even on their shoes that the top of the shoe starts wearing off. Um, that's kind of a, another sign of, uh, of spasticity, one of the more subtle, subtle types. Um, the most common conditions in the, in the, in the general public that causes uh, spasticity is, is stroke. Uh, but you have others, you know, like MS, and, and here we're today to talk about uh, transosmolitis, uh, NMOSD, MOGAD. Uh, so anything that can cause essentially an injury to the pathways in the spinal cord that essentially disrupts the, the calming voice from the brain uh, that makes these, uh, these neurons a little bit more quiet. The uh, treatment goals, so when we, when we talk about this is, uh, well, my first question always is if somebody complains about spasticity, how bad is it? Is it something you can just manage, or is it something we have to do something about? So, um, because if it's just simply, I feel a bit stiffer, and I don't have to, you know, I can overcome it, and I don't have any uh, functional issues with it, then I generally say, you know, we just do some conservative measures, like, like stretching, and nothing else. But once it starts sort of uh, in, in impacting function, we want to uh, make sure we can, can improve positioning, we want to improve mobility, and uh, if there's pain involved, definitely want to uh, make sure that we can address that as well. Uh, and one of the big goals is preventing contractures. Because sometimes what I see in clinic, you know, when people come to me, especially if they're in a wheelchair, and you're in the sitting position at all times, and the knee is essentially bent at 90 degrees at all times. And then you will see as you start opening it up that there's a lot of uh, tension in the, in the hamstrings. Um, and so I say, you know, we have to make sure that you prevent this from happening because if you keep sitting in this, in this short position, uh, because of the spasticity, the muscles will get shorter and shorter, and even if you want to, you can't open it up again. And especially in, since we are, and I'm not talking about rehab today, uh, one of our long-term goals for most of our patients is getting them out of the wheelchairs again if possible. You know, if you have contractures that, uh, that are you know, affecting especially your, your lower extremities, you know, they will prevent you from, from reaching that goal. So you also make sure that all your joints keep the same range of motion that you can actually uh, achieve those goals of uh, walking uh, long term. The uh, most of the uh, important thing to do, as I said earlier, is stretching. So uh, people ask me, so how, how often should I stretch? And I always say, you know, anytime you can think about this. So uh, at least two or three times a day. Uh, if you can do it on your own, it's great. Uh, if you need caregivers, you know, who can help you with, you, you should you definitely use that. Um, you can go from, from simple approaches, like for example, calf stretches that you can, if you can stand, you can just use your door frame, put your, put your toe uh, next to it and, and stretch your calves. Um, if you're looking for um, more detailed uh, ideas how to, how to stretch, uh, Google is a great place to be, Google and, uh, uh, and, and YouTube. So any muscle you can think of, there's, there's some video somewhere that tells you, okay, how to stretch that muscle. Um, exercise itself is, is really important. Uh, and endurance training. And so, uh, but overall, we're trying to, as, as spasticity becomes a little bit more, um, more involved, we are actually uh, trying to um, you know, use all kinds of uh, approaches, from a rehabilitation approach to oral medications. We're going to talk about those in a second, so some local treatments. And then most severe cases, you know, surgical treatments might be, might be involved. So when we talk about oral medications, uh, you see the, the three most commonly used ones, actually the top two are the most commonly used ones. So one is called baclofen, which is a pill that you take usually uh, about three times a day. Uh, the second one is tizanidine uh, or Xanaflex, uh, which will also be taking a couple times a day. And then in the more, more rare cases, we might use uh, dantrolene. 
Uh, but what you see, what all of these drugs have in common, they cause severe um, fogginess, uh, cloudiness, you know, uh, sort of mental uh, depression, and that, which is usually a hard part for most people to, to get used to. In general, over time, so if you start these medications, we start them slowly so that you can get used to it. And, and many people over time who have been using these medications will get rid of that fogginess, but never really completely. So uh, when we start treating with, with oral medications, uh, again, I, the first question is, A, do we need to treat? And if we have to treat, we're going to try to use the lowest possible doses. Uh, one other reason why we want to use the, low, the lowest possible doses is um, we did, uh, several years ago, we did a couple of clinical uh, or preclinical studies in the laboratory that showed by using some of these medications might get in the way of, uh, of, of neural repair. But that doesn't mean that we don't use them. We just to make sure we use them as, as, little, as little as possible. Uh, because sometimes I see patients coming to me from the outside that have seen some uh, general neurologist and they just mentioned somewhere they were stiff. And they just, someone just throws you know, baclofen on them and they say, you know, did you really need it? And, and usually, the, the, in most cases, the, uh, the answer is no. So you, if you use it, use it as, as sparingly as possible. Uh, but these are medications, once you take them, you have to take them on a regular basis. So they're not something like a Tylenol. You know, these are medications you have to uh, build blood levels to. Uh, the other things from a rehabilitation standpoint, you know, physical therapy, very important. Uh, occupational therapy, uh, uh, speech therapy, if spasticity, for example, involves the voice, which is a, which is a possibility. Um, at uh, our centers in, in, in Baltimore, we've been using uh, uh, activity-based rehabilitation. So combining traditional physical therapy and occupational therapy with uh, functional electrostimulation tends to be uh, a very powerful approach of getting people uh, at least to lower doses of specificity medications and some people even coming off. And that got published uh, actually more than 10 years ago, now 15 years ago. So it's definitely uh, working. Then when we talk about local treatments, so now we're going, going, we're going away from systemic treatments with the oral medications, we can use local treatments where we essentially pick out that one muscle or that, that group of muscles that seems to be most affected. So the most commonly known is Botox. Uh, and that's the same Botox that you would use for migraines or for wrinkles. Um, so it's essentially injected directly into that overactive muscle. Uh, the drug has been out uh, since 1989. Um, and so uh, people who know me who, are give, who have been given Botox to, they know my speech on this. They say, no, Botox was developed as a uh, uh, biomedical weapon, uh, actually as a weapon for, for mass destruction. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think in the 1920s, 1930s, uh, and so the intention initially was to spray this over cities, you know, and kill as many people as possible. Uh, turns out that it didn't quite work because by the time the stuff hit the ground, it was inactive. And so in the 1960s, the military turned this over to the, uh, uh, to the doctors and said, we can do something with it. And so then Botox was born essentially in, in, in the 1980s. Uh, so uh, hence one of, one of the warnings on there is, you know, if you use, uh, you can only use so many units of Botox uh, before we could cause some harm. So usually we use Botox when it's a, it's a limited number of muscles or we have some muscles that are really needing uh, some special attention to. So you know, how does it work? It essentially blocks, so you see a picture here of muscle fibers, this is the pink stuff, and then you see the, uh, uh, the sort of black triangular or, um, or rectangle shaped one things connected to those lines. These are essentially nerve endings and, uh, uh, and they're little intersections with, with the muscles. And when we give Botox, we essentially block those. So we cut those off. So now the nerve endings, you know, that's sending the signals from those party neurons, right, that are sending all these firing from the spinal cord, can't uh, directly connect with the muscle endings anymore. So that means the muscles can't respond to, those, to, those, to that firing. And so once we uh, disrupt that with Botox, then it takes about three months uh, for it to regrow uh, and make new connections. So hence the... Um, uh, the effect of Botox generally lasts around three months for, for muscle, for regular skeletal muscles. Uh, if you use it in a bladder, if you use it um, uh, in some other muscles, it could go up to six to nine months. But in general, we can retreat with Botox every, uh, every three months. It's, it's a very good treatment and very safe, even though when I scared you a little bit with the, the, the war analogy here. <laughs> 
So it has been, uh, you know, if you read that package insert for Botox, it's, you know, it's pages and pages and pages, because anything that's ever happened since 1989 is written down in there. So, um, yeah. So the, uh, more, if you had more severe cases, or if we had uh, more muscles involved, or if the oral medications don't work quite well, we have uh, intrathecal um, spasticity management, so it's an intrathecal uh, baclofen pump. Uh, or ITB pump, you see the, the picture there. That's essentially in injecting baclofen straight next to areas uh, of where the spinal cord is with a little catheter. So the pump itself is hidden underneath your skin, usually in the belly, and it's this tiny little um, catheter, feels like an angel hair spaghetti underneath the skin, uh, gets inserted right next to the spinal cord, and then it will trickle out uh, very slowly a baclofen. So the same oral baclofen that we use by mouth and now you do it next to the spinal cord. The beauty about intrathecal baclofen is that it only goes where it's needed to be. Because as you said, we want to calm down those, those party neurons. So it goes right next to the spinal cord. And uh, by doing so, we need about a thousand times less of baclofen than we would take by mouth. So you get uh, all these systemic side effects of like, the mental fogginess and cloudiness that is generally not a problem. The, uh, you see the picture here where it kind of gets, gets, gets inserted. Um, you can uh, program these pumps through your skin. So uh, it's a wireless connector that we can just hold over, over the body. And we can say how fast does the medication have to come out? Is there certain times of the day where we need more or some times of the day where we need less? Uh, all this can be done. We can read how long the pumps last. Usually a pump lasts about seven years. And then it has to be replaced. Um, there are centers virtually all over the United States, actually over the world, that can, that can do that. You know, so even you're free to travel, we have to refill these pumps at least uh, twice a year. So to refill them, we use a little needle and stick it into the, um, into the catheter in the center of the, of the pump. You see the little indentation there. Um, but they are extremely, working extremely well. And uh, the only thing that we always make sure is that we have a patient who is compliant. So if you're a patient who usually does what your doctor tells you, then you're a great patient for that. If you're generally doing whatever you want and you never show up to your follow-up appointments, it's not your medication. Uh, because you know, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want these pumps to run dry. Uh, because if they run dry, uh, if they empty out and you don't refill them in time, uh, then you could, go severe, could get severe withdrawal symptoms, which essentially you know, uh, can be uh, pretty bad. So we don't want to see that. But you get, to get a good team involved that does it all the time, uh, super safe. You can, you have essentially no activity restrictions you, you can work with. The, uh, uh, the last resort of spasticity, so if all these things fail, and there are some patients where this can happen, luckily in the last couple of years we see this less and less and less and less, there are surgical treatments. So if you can't do it by mouth, if you can't do it with Botox, if you can't do it with um, intrathecal, then you could use surgery. Uh, and the surgery approach is usually an irreversible approach, so where you would either cut the nerves as they go into, uh, in, into the particular limb, you can cut the tendons themselves to open this up again. So this is essentially the, the last resort that we don't really want to get to, uh, if, if at all possible. So uh, that's why when I say, you know, we, we, see, we try to see in our clinics the, the early signs of spasticity or contractures, uh, and, well, as soon as possible because we can prevent those with you know, aggressive stretching or even some, some medications so that we never have to get to the point uh, of, of surgical interventions for that. And uh, what's the most effective one of all of them? Now, what's the, what's the favorite answer in neurology? It depends, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, but in, in general, you know, it's, it's a combination approach from, from rehabilitation, some oral medications, uh, consider some local treatments, and really in a very last resort, we might use some, some surgical interventions uh, for spasticity. But ultimately, you want to do this under the guidance of a physician who's experienced in treating spasticity. It doesn't have to be a physician. It could be a, a nurse practitioner. Janet over there, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so any, any advanced practitioner uh, who is uh, versed in, in treating patients with spasticity should oversee that. Uh, and it also should be one in the hands of one physician or one, one clinician. Um, because if there are too many cooks in the kitchen, you know, it doesn't really work well. So similar to, similar to pain management. And so if we summarize this up, so spasticity is extremely common. You know, the reason is those party neurons in the, in, in the spinal cord that have lost the calming voice that comes from the, from the brain. 
Uh, and if we all put our, our hands together and our efforts together between rehabilitation and uh, some, some medic oral medications, maybe some injectable medications, um, and the biggest part is actually you uh, as, as, as the person involved, um, because you know, all the stuff that happens at home, for example, the stretching, you know, we can only tell you, we can't do it for you. So you uh, do it yourself or get your team involved to uh, prevent this from happening. We don't have the medication yet to make it completely go away. Right, because spasticity is really only a symptom of the, of, the, of the nervous system injury. Until we can actually fix nervous system injuries themselves, uh, we will not be able to make it go away. But we can make it a lot better um, and you know, make sure you see um, an expert who is, who is very versed in, in treating, treating that condition. Questions? Yes? We may need a microphone. Does anybody have one? Yeah. Um, so in regards to backlip, and I know you were talking about the side effects, do you know if with long-term use, those potential side effects like fatigue, confusion, um, things like that, do they potentially get worse or is it stable over the course of however long you use the baclofen? So, so generally over time, the use of oral baclofen, the, the uh, side effects get less. Uh, if they get worse, there's something else going on. Um, so usually, you know, the longer you're on, the less of the side effects people have. Um, in some of them, it never really goes away, but it doesn't really get worse over time. It usually gets better. And I believe there are a couple online questions. Mm -hmm. I think there's more and more over there, right? Did we see the hand? Yeah. Yes, hello. Um, for the aging adult that has, let's say, spinal stenosis, um, degenerative disc disease, and a lot of disc bulges, how do you differentiate whether that patient is ha being affected by specificity versus just the aging process? It's really hard. So uh, generally, I like seeing my patients for a very long period of time because I, we age together. So then I can see how did you look you know, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, when I see somebody new, it's hard to tell because uh, you know, as we get older, stiffness or generalized spasticity tends to take place. You know, anybody who you talk to of my older you know, parents and grandparents, and they always say, oh my God, I'm stiff. And I know they don't have any, uh, any at least to my knowledge, any prior existing strokes or, or central nervous system injuries. So it's still there. Um, but I think the, uh, the same principles apply. I mean, you still have to do, make him physically active, use a lot of stretching, and so then it really becomes more a semantic question, you know, is this, what is it from? Um, the only important thing is you wanna make sure if somebody starts developing spasticity down the road, that somebody actually looks that there's nothing else going on. For example, if you have you know, bulging discs on the spine, you know, could any of these discs actually pushing on the spinal cord that could potentially cause you know, spinal cord injury and, and worsen the spasticity. But other than that, if, if all this is removed, then uh, it would be safe to assume just use the same principles of, of spasticity treatment for them. Okay, thank you. One last part. Um, do you ever use a spinal stimulator for folks that are really struggling? Um, I know of a patient who has tried that, and I'm just wondering how often and when do you um, actually provide that type of treatment? So there are, uh, so I'm not sure how, how familiar people are with, with spinal cord stimulators, so they're called epidural stimulators. Uh, they have become a lot fancier over the last five, six years um, because they used to inquire, uh, require the, a big surgery where you open up the spinal column and then put the stimulator paddles right next to the spinal cord. Nowadays, you have uh, epidural stimulators that where you use a wire electrode that's essentially placed um, as an outpatient right next to the spinal cord and can be programmed. The uh, only indication currently in the United States for epidural stimulators is for management of, uh, of pain. Um, I have maybe 10 patients in my office who have epidural stimulators. They work very well for pain. I have not seen much of an effect of an epidural stimulator on spasticity. Um, I would, you know, yeah, I, I don't see that. It's usually it's, it's, a, it's for pain management. Thank you very much for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And 
So we only have time for two more, so we'll take two online questions. Yep. So question for Dr. Becker, what can you suggest for left facial paralysis? I had herpes zoster three years ago due to adverse effects of rituximab. What can you suggest to return to normal? I still have a feeling of rubber hand on my left face, just doing self-exercise. Thank you for answering my question. Wow, left facial paralysis. You're changing the topic here, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, left facial paralysis, so if people have Bell's palsy, which is essentially an injury to the, to the nerve that, that innervates uh, the motor function of your face, uh, and they can, uh, most of them have an, an incomplete recovery. Actually, I actually have a family member who has that, who used to be a uh, professional tuba player for the St. Louis Symphony, and then had to lose that profession because he couldn't do it anymore. There is some, uh, some experimental uh, evidence that if you were to use electrostimulation, to the, mus to the muscles of the face that are, that are affected that can help with some recovery. But in general, recovery is incomplete. No. It, there is one other option uh, to look into, and there are some surgeons who will do a nerve transfer where they'll take a piece of nerve from the functioning side of the face, move it to the other, and try and bring back some symmetric movement. It depends on how long ago the injury occurred. You, you said it was the second question? That's, yeah, and then there is there a relationship between spasticity and atrophy? So is the relationship between spasticity and atrophy. Yeah. So if you have an injury to the uh, central nervous system, uh, so the nerves that innervate uh, the limbs, if they get cut, for example, uh, that muscle that loses its input uh, may shrink in, in size. So there's, that's called atrophy. Uh, at the same time, because of the injury to the central nervous system, you can actually become spastic in the same muscle as well. So definitely there is a link. Um, what we see generally, if, if there is more um, of spasticity in that muscle, the muscles shrink less than people who don't have spasticity. So uh, uh, one of the prognostic markers that we sometimes look, especially in our acute uh, spinal, spinal cord injury patterns is if we see some spasticity, it's more a good sign because it means that there is some, some intact neural uh, circuitry versus if it's all uh, flaccid. I know we, we talked about this uh, before, then the circuitry is much more affected and may have a less uh, a worse prognostic outlook. Um, but definitely there is a link because I think the, the, the reason for both of them is the same. Thank you, Thank you for having me.